Welcome to our online worshippers on this, the second Sunday after Pentecost. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise, Praise befits the, the upright. upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Sing, sing to him a new song. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. On this Sunday we have a special focus on our youth. We recognize before you, Lord, that they are our future. Therefore, we commit them into your hands, asking your blessing upon them. May you guide them in your pathways, that their lives would glorify your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty, Almighty God, God, to whom all hearts, all hearts are open, open all, all desires known, known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. And so trusting in God's loving mercy and willingness to forgive, we confess together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, our, our Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone, for the sake of your Son, 
Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we pray the collect of the day. O God, o God source, source of, of life and, and ruler of, of the universe, universe you, you call us to share your work of healing. healing. Give us a true sense of the wholeness you offer. Make us worthy of your promises and use us in your restoration of creation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 9. Glory to Christ our Saviour. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread throughout the region. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Greetings. Let us pray. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In preparation for today, or for this homily, when I was reading the, the various readings, um, a few things came to my mind. Um, but actually what I'm going to be doing is focusing on the call of, of Matthew, which is in our Gospel reading. Um, and I think within this story there's a lesson for both the individual and the collective. But oftentimes when we read scripture, we can interpret it and, and apply it in a kind of moralizing, um, didactic and strict way. And um, this sometimes is not always that helpful. But if we begin to transcend patterns of dualistic thought and practice contemplative patterns of thought, we cease to see scripture and use scripture in this way. And we begin to realize that scripture has the ability or the power to speak very profoundly into the human condition and about the spiritual journey. So I'm going to refer now to the work of Richard Raw and Carl Jung, but it's a kind of a mishmash of the two, and say that each of us is composed of three parts, not body, mind, and spirit. I'm not referring to that distinction. Instead, I'm referring to the ego, sometimes known as the constructed self or the false self. Uh, that's one part. The other part is, is, the, is the true or potential self, and the third part is the shadow self. And the true self, or the potential self, emerges through a meeting of the shadow self and the ego. 
which is a very difficult and sometimes painful process. But the call of Matthew is instructive at a corporate level, that is for the church or for Christians generally, because it shows up what oftentimes are our pretenses at moral rectitude. And generally as Christians, we subscribe to, oftentimes to the illusion that we are basically morally upright and upstanding citizens. And in doing so, our egos can become a little bit inflated. We feel good about ourselves. We pat each other on the back. We affirm each other. And on one hand, there's nothing wrong with this. On the other, you know, whether explicitly or not, we compare ourselves with others that we deem less moral or less pure or less holy. And in, in, in doing that, even, we feel better about ourselves and we feel more affirmed. Now, the call of Matthew, as does much of Jesus' ministry, turns all of this on its head. And uh, just like Jesus uh, overturned the, the tables of the money changers in the temple. Because basically the punchline, the punchline of the call of Matthew is, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Jesus tells us here clearly that he has little interest in righteous people. And if, therefore, if we consider ourselves to be righteous, the bad news is that Jesus isn't that interested in us. He's much more interested in sinners, according to what he says in the call of Matthew. This is also uh, testified to in the Beatitudes, where the very first group who is mentioned to be blessed are the poor, which basically means in that context that it is the accursed, the cut off, and the sinful, because if you were poor, that's what you were 2,000 years ago in first century Palestine. It's also reflected in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee, where it's not the righteous Pharisee who's justified before God, but rather the sinful tax collector. So the call of Matthew is instructive at that level because it forces us to reconsider our pretenses and our personas at a collective level. But it's also instructive at an individual level because it represents a transformation or the beginning of the transformation of Matthew. Now, Matthew is a tax collector. This means a number of things. It means, firstly, that he is a sinner. It means because he cannot remain ritually clean in terms of Jewish Torah because he's constantly handing dirty, impure Roman currency. A little bit like uh, the prostitute, Matthew is rendered unclean by virtue of his profession. Because he is legally or technically a sinner, it also means that those who, in authority, the religious leaders, regard him with um, a great deal of disdain and dislike. And in addition to that, based on his perceived collaboration with the Romans, who were despised by zealous Jews, based also on his enrichment, his perceived enrichment at the expense of his fellow countrymen, and his perceived extortion of his fellow countrymen, and his perceived greed, he's regarded not just by the authorities, but much by, by many of his compatriots, much of Jewish society, with a great deal of disdain. Now, we don't know how it was that Matthew got into this profession. Perhaps he had no choice, but I think we can safely assume two things. Firstly, we can assume that Matthew enriched himself, or at least he, or at least he made a decent living in financial terms by virtue of being a tax collector. But second, that Matthew have, must have had a very low sense of self-worth, self-esteem, due to the lack of affirmation and indeed outright hostility aimed at him from his fellow countrymen by virtue of his profession. So basically, he feels like a piece of rubbish, but financially he's not too bad off. Now, whereas when we considered the call of Matthew at a general or corporate level, um, and we said that it's an opportunity for the church to re-examine and perhaps to drop some of our pretenses or facades, um, for Matthew as an individual, it is also a call to examine the identities that we or he assumes on the basis of other people's opinions of us and other people perhaps assigning us with certain identities. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Enneagram, but I would hazard a guess and say that Matthew is a five on the Enneagram. And the, the root sin or the pitfall of the five, according to the, the, the theory around the Enneagram, is miserly, miserliness or stinginess. And it, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in a material sense. It, it very often is in an emotional um, or personal way. So for the five who is emotionally stingy, it means that they're very protective and guarded over how much they give of themselves to others. And they, they, they do this mistakenly 
mistakenly thinking that by guarding their personal resources, they will not lose any of their personal resources. Um, and it's perhaps motivated by, by the fear of loss. But the irony, or even tragedy, is that in being so guarded and protected, they actually deprive themselves of, of precisely that thing which they need, which is human interaction and love and affirmation. Now again, we don't know how Matthew came to be a tax collector, but I think there's, again, that there's a good chance that he's a five, that, that his roots in was miserliness, that he was motivated by a certain amount of greed and acquisitiveness. This is another f a synonym that we can use in describing the, the five. They are acquisitive. They want to try and acquire. Um, and in, in his case, it was financial. And he did this believing so that so long as he did this, he would be fine. While at the same time, in actual fact, he was deprived of the love and affirmation of his compatriots. Now, in closing, I will let you draw your own conclusions as to what I've said. But in closing, I'm reminded of a refrain that Jesus often uses in different contexts, sometimes in relation to the, the disciples' understanding of the parables, sometimes in relation to the parable of the talents. In Matthew's Gospel, he uses the, ref the refrain twice, and it runs as follows, but it's basically repeated ver verbatim. To the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Matthew 13, 12. In other words, that which you think is valuable, but, but, but which really isn't, might be taken away. While those, for who, those who know and recognize what they have is truly valuable, these people will have what they already have added to. May be blessed, friends. Amen. We now come to the prayers of the church, so let us pray. On this Youth Sunday, we pray around areas and issues affecting young people in our homes, our communities, and throughout our country. We thank you, Lord, for the relative blessing we receive and experience when compared with so many people of our own age in our country. We thank you for the gift of quality education we thank you for the provision of our parents. We thank you for the safety and security of our homes. In all these things, may we forever give you praise and thanksgiving and be mindful of those with less. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah, yeah, our prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the gift of parenting. We commit into your hands our parents and thank you for everything they do for us. We know they always seek what is best for us, while at the same time it is often very difficult to attain this. Thank you for their efforts, dedication, and unconditional love. Please be with single parents, grandparents who are raising grandchildren, and child-headed households. Amidst the struggles and challenges of life, may you grant all those fulfilling parental roles to Mina patience and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our schools and all those called to the field of education. We know how important education is in the growth and development of young people. And so we commit into your hands our schools, our teachers, and all school staff. May you grant our teachers wisdom and encouragement to fulfill their callings to the best of their ability. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray especially for the young people of this parish. We thank you for a junior church program that is well coordinated. We thank you for the teachers who volunteer to facilitate junior church and teen church. May our children be blessed through these programs and may you instill in them the values of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for our young people at university, whether here or elsewhere. May your hand of protection remain upon them. Grant them diligence and self-discipline to complete their courses to the best of their abilities. We pray for those preparing to leave university and enter the workplace. May you provision jobs for them and open the right doors which will lead to successful careers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
We pray for those of our young people and all young people who may feel alienated or alone. We pray for those who have lost parents. We pray for those living in households of limited means. We pray for the burdens faced by young people throughout our country. We pray also for those who have experienced bullying or who are ostracized, especially on the basis of their sexual orientation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we commit into your hands the lives and well-being of all our children. We commit their future into your hands, praying that you will prosper them physically, mentally, and emotionally. May you grant them an outpouring of your love and compassion, that they would have a very real sense of connectedness with their peers and the world in which they live. And may you call them to be leaders in the world in, the, in their future careers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And so we accept these, our prayers, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Pray over the offering. Faithful Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant eternal life. You have said that you are a good Father who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honour and power and strength, be unto you our God for ever and ever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we pray together the prayer that the Lord himself taught us. Our, our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May God, who gives patience and encouragement, give you a spirit of unity to live in harmony as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In, in the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.
St. Michael's when I was 10 years old in grade 4, not knowing much about church besides singing, dancing and worship. I was baptized in 2017 and thereafter had my admission for communion. After a long break from church due to COVID in 2022, I enrolled for my confirmation lessons. I learned a lot about my religion, who I am as a person and my father. Confirmation has helped me on my journey and, as, and my understanding on the sacrament, service, fellowship, and faith. I thank my junior church, teen, and confirmation teachers, and my fellow students for making this a memorable and fulfilling journey in Christ. My part in scripture, Peter 3, verses 13 to 17. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? It's where peace begins. 